are you both feeling? This is Gun Cranks. Thank you. Yes. Hi there, everybody. Welcome back. Yes, the Gun Cranks. We're like that bad penny. We just keep coming back. I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. We're here with Tom McHale, the editor of American Handgunner, and his retired royalness, Mr. Roy Huntington. Hey, guys. How's it going? Royalness. Good to be alive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody's surviving. We've uh, passed the 4th of July. Everybody's got all their fingers and various other appendages still attached. I'm celebrating all month long. So. That's outstanding. That's outstanding. And, and our producer is going to the Olympics, so I felt it appropriate <laughs> to wear my, my USA jersey today. So. Hey, nice tie-in plug. Check out the uh, couple of editions ago of the Guns Magazine podcast. I talked to our, our affable producer, Sherry Legate. She's the color commentator for the NBC coverage of the in, uh, Olympic shooting sports. So check that out. A lot of people, uh, you get the insider inside scoop of what it's like to produce big time television. But Right now, as she called us, we're Gorilla Television. We are the Gun Cranks, and guys, I've got an idea for today. Let's just do one big segment of letters, because we all know we deal with it every day. We get letters on top of letters, on top of letters, on top of letters, and most of them are pretty nice. Some of them, well, they're entertaining. So can, I write, can I write a letter in? Because I have a sure. letter that I'd like to write in. It's, why, isn't, why, why isn't Three Gun part of the Olympics? Yeah, that's a good question. Hmm. I mean, Sherry? On. Oh. Maybe IDPA. Is she, is she asleep at the switch? Something. Testing. I don't know. Hmm. Calling the command trailer. Hmm. <laughs> be a lot more interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Okay, well, let's get on. I've got the first letter. It's actually, put the spectacles on here. It's regarding gun cranks, of all things. Hmm. Regarding your recent gun cranks rant about the 22 versus the 25, you may need to consult his honorable retired whatever, which would be Roy, but my 69 year plus year old remaining couple of synapses fired off a memory that the automatic the sorry the original rationale for this round was that it would feed more reliably in a 22 than a 22 in semi-automatic pistols available at the time. Other than that, a couple of hundred of them in a bag would make an okay trot line weight. And that's John from Kansas. I thought that was pretty funny, the trot line weight. So Roy, you know all things. Was that really the idea behind the 25? I mean, you were around when they developed that in, what, 1910, right? Well, you know, I had a meeting with John Browning <laughs> back then. And he came to me and he said, Now, Roy, uh, I'm having trouble getting 22 long rifle to feed in these little guns. What do you recommend? And I said, Well, you know, if you just simply made a 25 caliber full metal case bullet, it would feed more reliably. And he said, it is so good that I could just stop by and visit with you like this. And that's actually the true story of okay. how the 25 HCP uh, got invented. So. so was the design criteria part of the design criteria to actually bounce off a Frisbee when you <laughs> shoot them at Frisbees? Because that's happened. Well, you, know, you have to remember back in those days, nobody seemed concerned about lead or hollow point bullets or anything. And so it truly was, how do I get this gun to function? And that's why all those early auto cartridges were all full metal case. Uh, they, yeah. they didn't think of anything else. And remember, uh, you know, a 3220 or a, a, even the 25 ACP was considered enough. You know, that was adequate stopping power for a pocket pistol. So. Yep. Times change and social needs evidently change, and that's why we have the 44 Magnum now as pocket guns. <laughs> there you go, straight from the horse's mouth. Well, get rid of that one. <laughs> I've got one more, and then you guys can jump in here. It says, Hi, the double rifle article was excellent, and that we did a, uh, a big feature, Jeremy Clow, in the uh, I believe September issue of Guns Magazine. I, I was thinking a few months back that I always used to read all the gun magazines and they all had safari, you know, type guns on the cover. They'd have these wonderful uh, Jeffries or Holland and Holland double rifles and, you know, a lion getting ready to claw somebody into, you know, a big puddle of goo. And you just don't see that much anymore. So I commissioned Jeremy to write a piece on double rifles and got some beautiful artwork uh, from all the uh, English double rifle makers. So anyway, the double rifle article was excellent. It was refreshing to get away from polymer and aluminum. The London and Birmingham, England, gun makers build lasting treasures of walnut and blue steel. Their museum quality guns are a bit too ornate for my taste, but unique for the engraver's art. 
And it says, goes on to say, could you please do an, a series on other types of British guns, bespoke, irregular, double square bridge Mauser actions? Uh, as a matter of fact, I own several Rigby's, Purdy's, Holland's, and Holland, Holland and Holland's, and Wesley Richards. And he puts in parentheses, they're baseball caps, that is. And that's about where I'm at. Oh, so <laughs> I was going to be really impressed there for a minute. Yeah. Exactly. So apparently nice. I, I cut off his name, but uh, whoever wrote that, thank you very much. So <laughs> Nice. That's cool. I, hey. You know, I think it goes to show, though, is that we've used this analogy before, is that I like old cars, and so I read about $200,000 Packards, you know, and you read about Rolls Royce, and I'll never own one. But by golly, it's sure fun to learn about them and see where the rest of the history comes from. And so yep. I applaud your I effort agree. there. I enjoyed that article, too. Excellent. So, well, huh? I, I got one on a uh, current topic that's come up a number of times, 80% uh, firearms. Uh -huh. right. So, Brent, we just did a podcast on this. Yep. We did a cover story for guns. We've got some stories in the DIY issue. Um, but here, here's a good, good question. On your 80% arms build, did you put a serial number or personalized serial number on them? If not, why? Well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> Amendment two, baby. Because freedom, that's mm -hmm. why. No, no, but seriously, uh, I thought this was a good question uh, that we should talk about for a second because I think all three of us have some direct input on this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to direct the, the question here. Um, I'll answer the first part. Why didn't I put one on? Because I don't have to. It's not yes. legally required um, to, to do that. And I felt no compelling desire of my own or need to put a serial number or identifying mark on that. It's my gun. I have to keep it. I can't transfer it. Now, kicking it over to you, Brent, what did you learn about moving and transferring 80% arms? That it's a, question, but it's a really. pain in the neck. You can't do it. <laughs> there, there's no way a dealer can enter it into their books. And if you're going to move it across state lines, because that was the problem we ran into, um, the issue isn't out yet, but the cover is a solid block of aluminum shaped like a receiver, which is the raw material because as we discovered too late in the process, Tom couldn't complete the gun and then ship it to our professional photographer in another state because nobody will handle it. Um, I still wonder if that's actually true or not, but bottom line was we couldn't find anybody to do it and we certainly didn't want to violate any federal laws. So there's a big chunk of aluminum on the cover, but that's kind of cool too. Actually, now, if you did if you did want to do that, though, we found out that you can right. if you register it with the ATF right. and add a serial number, do pay $200, wait a year or two, and do all that. <laughs> now, Roy, that brings us to you. If someone wanted to mark their firearm with the serial number, or I'd like to put like maybe an engraved unicorn on one of the ones I just built, like how would I go about doing that, technically? <laughs> Get your little five dollar engraver. <laughs> and, oh no! And Come on, you're the machinist here, gunsmith, yeah. and all that. No. Oh, you mean Come on, technically? How, would you do it right? how to do? Technically, how yeah. do you do it? Well, you know, yeah. let's revert though for a second. I have several single shot twenty two rifles that were made in the early part of the century, and they didn't have serial numbers. And uh, that was from the factory who manufactured them, and you can still buy them in gun stores. And when they go to enter it on a forty four seventy three, they simply put none in where there's a serial huh. number and so you don't and so that's why i'm a little surprised because i'll bet you technically these dealers can receive a non-serialized gun because remember the serial number hasn't been defaced or removed so right. that's that's illegal this gun at time of manufacture did not get a serial number and i don't think that that's illegal at any level, especially in this method of manufacture. And so it brings up a good question and I would like to do a little more research because I know sometimes I've shipped a gun directly to a dealer, uh, you know, to, to, for a private party sale or something. And a lot of dealers won't receive a gun from a private individual. They insist that it be sent to them from a federal firearms licensee, yeah. except for one thing. According to the BATF, it's perfectly legal Yep. to receive a gun from a private party. Yeah. Uh, yep. You just have to send a copy. I do that copy. all the time. Yeah. yeah, and normally I do it all the time. And so uh, I have a feeling, we'll have to get back to everybody on this, but I have a feeling that 
an FFL could receive a gun like that with no serial number. Uh, that, that we'll, was, we'll verify and get back to you. That was kind of my thought, and I wish I'd thought of the idea, because I'm like you, I've got some old shotguns here that don't have any serial numbers, and they're perfectly yeah. legal. But You're, I think yeah. it was... You can buy and sell them. Yeah, yeah. I think but it was one of those... But you didn't make, you didn't manufacture Yeah, that's them. true. I think that's the... That's the other layer here yeah, that could in be. this particular case. I, I think you it boils down gun. to nobody knows the answer, so it's easier just to, and safer just to say no. And so yeah. many of these laws are like that, aren't yeah. they? <laughs> when you ask the BATF and you get an answer and you still don't know what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll let you know if we decide at some point it's wrong, yeah. right? <laughs> it's, yeah. <laughs> well, Roy, I think you're up. Well, you know, I have a couple of them. Um, and I think one of them is really good. This is from a guy named John Fars, Farsworth. So John, he says, I have an old 22 rifle that's a family heirloom, uh, but the bore is worn out. Uh, a friend said I could reline it, and what does that mean? And I thought that's a good question. We've answered it a few times in the past. A lot of these old family single shot 22s were shot with black powder 22 ammo in the early years and of course nobody ever cleans their 22s and so they they again they end up looking like a coal mine after a little while but most competent gunsmiths can do a reline and all that really means is they disassemble the gun and they do a process where they drill out a hole that goes all the way through the bore using special long drill bits courtesy of brown owls and uh and then they buy a section of rifled tubing and then they either s uh, sweat solder it in or uh, epoxy it in, and then chamfer the muzzle and cut a new chamber in it, and you have a brand new 22 rifle again. And it, it, it has real minimum impact on how it looks. And so if you do have an old gun like that, for goodness sakes, you know, get that thing back in order and start shooting. And, uh, and it's usually not terribly expensive. I mean, you're talking a $150 or a $200 kind of a job. So I hope that gets you back going, John. Excellent advice, and uh, I've got a gun here that I may have to do that with here pretty soon. Well, cool. guys, our, our own Dr. Will Dabbs, and he writes for uh, both us and American Handgunner. He's, he's one of my favorites. The guy can turn a phrase like nobody. Well, we get a lot of mail f uh, for him, and I'm not sure exactly which story this is in reference to, but I had to share this. And uh, Roy, I think you'll get a kick as you're a retired cop as I am. It says, Dear Dr. Dabbs, summer of 1982, I was a patrol officer in Lexington, Kentucky. Beautiful weather, window down, shades on, looking cool. Jaw full of Havana Blossom. That's a chewing tobacco. I'm cruising at 45 MPH. There was a small square of sky I could spit into that would blow away from the window. Then an errant gust of wind ruined my day. Juice hit me in both eyes. I pulled over and tried to wash it out with water. No go. A small girl and her mom walked by. Mom, why is that cop crying? Look straight ahead and keep walking, darling. And that's from our friend, the Kentuckian. <laughs> nice. You're right. That was the epitome of, uh, of swab and deboner in those days. The, the, you know, what do you call it? The mirrored Ray-Bans oh, yeah. you know, yeah, the, they used to wear? Well, for a while you we, called them like Ponch and uh, who, uh, uh, what was the show? John. Yeah. Ponch and John and Ponch Chips. Ponch and John. Yeah, they were Chips glasses. Yeah. We called them. Ship glasses. <laughs> they, well, they actually banned them on, on the police department, my agency. <laughs> yeah, they said you weren't allowed to. It was too intimidating. Yeah. You know, so all we did was just got other ridiculous sunglasses. <laughs> you know, that actually, that kind of reminds me, though, one time I was, I had just gotten, it was a hot, hot, hot summertime. I had just gotten this, like, really nice ice cream cone. And, and a radio call came out of an injury accident up the road on this you know really uh, busy road and i really didn't want to throw that out the window because you know how it is you get your hamburger and just about just the time you're going to bite it in you get that beep beep yep. beep you know and you go ah crap, you throw it out the window and off you go and i just really didn't want to and so i turned on my lights and sirens and and i i wasn't a high speed run all i was doing was clearing traffic to get out of the way and uh, so I drove up Convoy Street, and I, by the time I got there, I had eaten the ice cream cone. So I got out looking <laughs> swab and deboner. Well, sure enough, somebody called and complained that they saw a policeman driving up with his lights and sirens on eating an ice cream cone. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and they, from where it was, oh, you know, my sergeant called to meet with me, and I remember, you know how you do to the police car meet where you both pull up like that? And uh, he just looked at me over the top of his glasses. You know how they do that? <laughs> 
and you know they don't have to say anything <laughs> yeah and i just said yeah it was me and he started to laugh and he and he drove off yeah <laughs> so well i oh well I, better i had the similar experience i was in training riding with the sergeant we had just pulled through dairy queen got uh two uh strawberry milkshakes big ones and it was hot <laughs> And same thing, personal injury accident, everybody's going, running hot. So we get there, we get that all taken care of, we get back in the car, he goes, wow, I'm hot, what'd you do with our, our milkshakes? I said, well, I threw them out. What? I said, well, yeah, as soon as we pulled out of the parking lot, I tossed them. He's like, okay, so first, you litter, and they're full, so just milkshake had to go everywhere, and I wanted a milkshake. We had just paid for those. I got in big trouble over that one. So, well, while I've got the while I've got the floor, Kentuckian had another email that I had to add to, and I wrote a story on Insider uh, here a month or two ago about my 50 rules for life, and it's you know just the simple stuff: trust no one except your mother, and keep an eye on her. Well, Kentuckian <laughs> sent me an email, and and he had some other rules, and this one is number three: no matter how much they beg and plead, or how much they tell you how much fun it will be. Never ever let your sex partner put handcuffs on you. No exceptions. Right, you know I'm writing that one down. That's all there is to it. That you know. That's a Sorry. Guns <laughs> no hobbling. <laughs> That's a. That could be a potentially good life rule right there. I have a feeling that Mr. <laughs> Kentuckian speaks from experience. I have. So, I suspect. So <laughs> moving along, somebody else, please read another email. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll jump in on that. Okay, so. So, so I got one here from Dan Cummings, and he, he says, as a subscriber and one that enjoys your magazine, mainly American Handgunner, I don't think he enjoys guns, That's good I enough. urge you to end your use of Facebook due to that company's de decision to continue banning President Trump. I don't want to support those that are not resisting this suppression. So this is an interesting, con I'm, I took the liberty of broadening this topic from just Donald Trump to... Facebook being evil in general, right? I mean, they censor all kinds of people and are kicking people off right and left and hiding posts and all manner of evil things. And and I have to tell you, I I, I want to ask you guys' opinion on this, but I've kind of I've kind of gone back and forth on this issue. My immediate you know response was to say, well, forget them. I'm getting off now. You know, we're not doing anything with American Handgunner on Facebook anymore. Uh, but then I thought about it some more and I said, you know what? There's something to be said for remaining in enemy territory. Yep, yep. Right? Yep. Right? So I think I think our our MO now is we're going to talk like we always have and say what we always say and try and get kicked off. <laughs> so there's still a lot of What do you what do you think, Brent? What's Well, your, what's this your is take exactly this like I got a couple of uh, reader mails uh, we put out uh, the John Connor print book, uh, the original Gun Crank. And if you haven't seen any of his columns, you got to go back. We do an email, sign up for that. But we collected a bunch of his prior stories, and we, we published them on Amazon. And I got several letters saying, Amazon's evil, blah, blah, blah. How, you know, I will not support them. I, I want this book, but I'm not going to do it. And my reply was, A, I agree with you. They are not pro-Second Amendment. Um, they're not as anti, maybe, as unless something has happened recently. They're just, but they're not supporters. There's no question about that. But I, I kind of look at it this way. First, practical standpoint, it's the only game in town, sadly. If somebody Pro 2A starts something comparable to Amazon, I will certainly go there and shop there. So it's the only game in town. And number two, just like Tom said, I like forcing Amazon to use their printing presses to print something that supports the Second Amendment. It yeah. just makes me happy every time I see one sell. So it's it's one of those, I agree totally, but hey, be subversive in their own backyard. I think well, subversive in their backyard is the key, you know? And you know the old keep your friends close and <laughs> your closer. enemies closer? Yep. It's like know what they're doing. It's like I use PayPal, and I know PayPal is anti-gun basically, yeah. you know? But I use PayPal anytime I can when I order firearms accessories online <laughs> or I buy something from eBay that's firearms related and I pay with PayPal. I always go, ha, 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 you know. That's funny. And then, then there's another one. There's a certain online transfer service that we tend to use often around here. And, uh, yeah. and they are absolutely overtly liberal, just beyond description 
yeah. you know, woke at every level. And I know every time I send a huge gun file of video or something using their free <laughs> service, I always kind of go, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if they only knew it would probably make them insane. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. we shall overcome. Well, this very episode will be shipped up to our producer via that we hope it arrives service. Yeah. We hope it arrives. <laughs> <laughs> Probably won't now. Which one is that? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Now you just, you yeah. know. It's so, Sherry, when you don't get today's episode, we, uh, we're we looking for a new transfer. <laughs> hey, but that's okay. I'm it's all okay. for that. I'm yeah. Like, we're, we're staying on all the old evil social medias. Uh, we don't pay them a dime of cash money. No, I know they sell ads and do whatever they do. But, you know, hey, if, if we're getting people that uh, to see our content, which we are not filtering in any way to accommodate those bozos. Uh, great, you know, let them kick us off. I agree. And I have heard yeah. some, some successes though, where people have basically worn down a company <laughs> where they finally <laughs> just give up and say, all right, you know what, you're right. You guys yeah. are right, I'm sorry. You know, and they release yeah. the bands and they, you know, cooperate and so. There's a lot there of backlash, you, you know. Mm -hmm. I think they might be surprised at the amount of backlash just in general to well, this behavior. Yeah, and you know what, if you think about it, we're actually doing this with the NRA as we speak. In other words, we, we don't necessarily support everything that they're doing, but we don't advocate that you leave them. You know, in other mm -hmm. words, keep, keep, you know, keep the NRA alive. So we want to keep YouTube going, but we do have to teach them a lesson or two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I've got a, a easy one. Um, and this is from... Uh, it says Uncle Caleb. <laughs> it's his signature. He says, why should I believe what I read in your magazines as opposed to what I see on YouTube or online forums and blogs? And I mean, you know, where do we start? Uh, but I think it's a fair question because I, I'm sure you guys see it. I'll, I'll get readers say, hey, you know, I saw this guy on YouTube and he said this about this. You know, why should I, why did your article say this, something different? And how I've always answered that through the years is that unlike many of the YouTube and forums and bloggers and stuff like that, we really have a staff of really senior people who vet everything. And so when Brent gets an article from somebody, and it doesn't matter who, John Taffin, Masada, you, me, anybody, well, he reads it with a critical eye. And he makes sure that we're not, you know, just <laughs> trying to feed a line of it out or something. And so, so when we qu quote statistics or, uh, you know, facts and figures or give an opinion, uh, I think all of us have historically questioned it. And then if it passes muster, well, then okay, you know, then we, we allow that to go. And I know I've always reached out to other writers, the senior writers we have, something will happen, it's a single action, I'll reach out to John Taffin and say, John, what's your experience yeah. here? And then he'll, you know, he'll educate me and then you will research online. And so, I mean, that's my opinion. What do you guys say? I, I think there's another angle to support what you just said, and that is um, volume of established credible work. And what mm. I mean by that is Handgunner has been publishing since 76 and Brent Guns was 55. 50s? What? 55. I don't remember. Yep. 55? 55? Okay, so that's a long time. We're talking about a lot of content. And believe me, sir, when we get something wrong, <laughs> we hear it. We hear about it from you guys well, <laughs> very quickly. And to expound so, on that, Tom, um, is our writers. I will stack a Masad Ayub a Mike Venturino, a John Taffin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, against... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, I write for and guns Tom on McHale. occasion. <laughs> and, oh, and that guy that's in on the other part of the screen. I didn't know if you were going to agree Boy, to that one. <laughs> you know, these guys are what you call subject matter experts. They, they happen to be able to string nouns and verbs together, but first and foremost, they knew the original guys. They are speaking of firsthand or very close secondhand experience. And I gotta say, we all know a lot of folks in the uh, social media kind of realm, and some of them are great. But some of them, as Roy told me one time, we were talking to somebody and Roy sent me a little message, says, to this guy, the world just started six years ago. Now, he may be a really smart and really sharp guy, but how much experience, good and bad, can you pack into say six years versus 60 for a John Taffin? 
I rest my case. Yeah. Yeah, well, I agree with you. You know, and, and when I talk to these people and you say, uh, I was actually visiting with a fellow here yesterday, and he was one of those younger guys, but he was open-minded. And his world truly started at Glocks and AR-15s. And so I took him out back here, and we fired a, a single-action Army 45 Colt out to 100 yards. We fired a 3220 single shot uh, 1885 Browning rifle, and all of these were completely foreign to him. He said, "I have, I had no idea this even existed," and he said, "And this is so much fun. Where do I learn more about this?" But that's and that's the difference, is it? I think. I think we have a broad range of experience and we like to try to bring it all to the table. So, uh, but I, I do want to ref uh, make sure that what Brent said is really true. There are a lot of good uh, content producers and experienced people that, who do YouTube and have forums and blogs. Mm -hmm. And we all watch them and I do research with them and stuff like that. But you do have to kind of learn to see the difference between the two. But overall, when you pick up a page of our magazine and read it, it's been well vetted, and I think you can yep. rely on it. So. And, you know, I've always said the we get a lot of reader mail, and, and 85 90%, 95% of it maybe is always positive. But occasionally you get a, you know, you're ugly and you've got bad breath. Okay, I don't care. What <laughs> makes me crazy, and we just had this not too long ago, they actually found a factual error from a really good writer. That makes me nuts because we should have caught it, you know. And, and I hate the fact there's many tens of thousands of magazines out there that there's a mistake in. But uh, the flip side of it is we're human and we do vet it as best we can. But trust me, that, that gives everybody serious heartburn if we make a teeny tiny mistake. So anyway, I, I've got a good one here. I love getting letters for our writers and we do that all the time and I, and I always forward them. And you got to understand um, some of the writers like interacting directly but being on the receiving end of a lot of this sometimes you just don't necessarily want to get into a dialogue with folks because you know some people want to keep their privacy and I totally respect that but anyway this one was for Dr. Dabs again and it says as I leaped through the magazine I came on the Doc Holiday story and that was just written by Will Dabs a couple months ago at first glance I thought the picture of Doc Holiday was a picture of Dr. Dabs in his younger years the likeness is amazing Reincarnation, question mark? I guess we'll never know. By the way, how is Doc Dabs at poker? And that was, Stephen wrote that. And then uh, Will responded, like golf, I fear my greatest strength at poker is comedy relief. So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> and, and he's right. He's such he a is. Gem. And he looks yeah. like a young uh, Doc Holliday. It's kind of scary. He really does. I never thought of that before. Yeah. You know, I, I have to say something about Will. When in the SHOT Show the last, oh, I don't know, four or five years, I've been uh, able to spend some time with him. I, Brent, I think you were, didn't you have pizza yeah. with us yep. one night or we something? We hung out in, in our was, room and Will it was, was there. glorious. Yeah. And he is simply a constant source of entertainment to be around him. His sage... <laughs> Just down home Mississippi take on life. Uh, I I just sit back with my glass of wine and let <laughs> Will have let the him show. hold court. <laughs> it's just great. Yeah, let him hold court. So uh, it's very fun. Hey, hey Roy, I found your kindred spirit. <laughs> uh oh, this is scary. <laughs> no, his name is Jim Brown, one of our readers, and uh, he wrote in a. a actually a, a lengthy very interesting email I won't read the whole thing for time but the, the gist of it is he's, he read your article on snubby revolver accuracy mm -hmm. meaning that they're perfectly accurate right they're just harder to shoot well so uh, he, he kind of uh, does a similar routine to you and keeps one in his in the back of his range bag for when people are complaining about snubby revolvers and whips <laughs> it out for an occasional range bet you know hey i bet i can knock oh, yeah. that can off a post at 50 <laughs> yards you know sure. like, no way they're not accurate you yep. know you can't hit water from with that thing and um so i thought i thought that was kind of funny he he actually literally was talking about uh, you know just a little simple rest knocking soda cans off at 50 60 yards so i'd uh, I, I think we'd love to hear your perspective on that you I know, think you have a police range story. Uh, well, we do. That topic. We do do that. Yeah, and you know, not to dwell on it, but I, and actually, I had another reader uh, write me a note, and I, I it seemed like I just got it. Maybe you forwarded it to me. It was he said 
He said, like Roy, I always used to keep like a couple hundred dollars in my wallet to buy the Aaron, you know, short barreled revolver at the pistol range when someone was frustrated with it. And uh, I, I did a video on that the other day. And then afterwards, the guns tended to lay out on my desk here. And uh, so I went ahead and shot them two or three more times. And I have an 80 yard steel torso down here. And I, sure enough, I mean, it's not because I'm better than anybody, but I was able to consistently hit that 80 yard silhouette with an air weight uh, Model 36, you know, or air weight J-frame. So, so just stay the course, you know, watch those videos that we were talking about and read some articles and you too can do it. Well, I think, I think that's what it boils down to, right? There, there's this myth that that little two inch, or, you know, one and seven eighths inch barrel cannot be as accurate as a three or four or six inch barrel. And that is absolutely patently false, you know? Absolutely uh, patently false. You're exactly but right. The mechanical so. accuracy can be just as good, you know, within measurement capabilities. It's just harder to shoot well. So <laughs> it I, is. I think, I think the takeaway point is don't blame the revolver. Keep, keep working at it and you'll have an epically good trigger press when you get accurate with a snubby yep. revolver, right? You know, and, and toward that, uh, and before we beat this all to death here today, because it's a lot of fun with this reader mail, uh, I had High Point sent me a High Point 9mm pistol the other day, which I will be making a video on, and I want to do some accuracy testing, and we're going to do real world testing, and so hopefully that'll generate some more reader mail that we can do this. Uh, Brent, before we make everyone go insane, well, you want to wrap I, yes, this up? Yes, but I was going to throw out a quick question on a, on a serious note, not that we're very serious very often, but we're one of the few magazines the editors actually look at and respond to mail. Now, we get such a volume, that doesn't always happen, so don't be offended if you, I didn't answer your mail personally. But Tom, give me your thoughts on that. I mean, that's pretty unique in this business. Yeah. On uh, the reader mail? Yeah. Uh, it is interesting because I think there's a, I wonder if the internet has had, had some bad influence on that concept in general, you know, or maybe it's always been that way. Maybe some, some magazines do and some don't, don't answer mail or don't, don't care. I mean, this is, um, I don't know, is it, is it a cultural thing or is it just uh, the volume of stuff these days people are giving up on that approach? I, I mean, think I, it's... I have some fascinating conversations with people. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, I agree. Over email and it, people I would never meet yeah. otherwise, well, right? Well, remember, is is you? It's no any smart businessman would talk to his clients, and so our readers are our clients, and so why would we not engage them? Years ago, and I'm talking 35 years ago when I started writing, I used to know all the editors, you know, the Guns and Ammo and American Rifle and everybody, and when I told them that I responded to reader mail, they looked at me yeah. like I was from Mars. And the, generally what they do is that they would get the three or four letters that they needed to fill the page in the magazine. And then an editorial assistant would ed, you know, proof them. And then they might have a one word response or two word response. And that was it. And I had editors brag to me that they never took a reader call and they never read any reader mail. And I thought, why on earth is that? Why be proud of yeah. that? You know, you're crazy. If you ran a business like that, you'd soon be out of business. And they're out of business. <laughs> How about that? Well, as, mm -hmm. as we've made it pretty clear, we like interacting with our viewers and our readers and our listeners. So you can drop us. I'll, I'll go ahead and go into it. Get a hold of Tom at editor at AmericanHandGunner.com. And you can get a hold of me at editor at GunsMagazine.com. It's pretty simple. And you can always send us an actual. We also get real live mail. And we get a little package from the home office. The address is right there in the masthead of our magazines and on the bottom of our website. If you want to send us a card, letter, or small denomination bills, we're all about that. We get the care package from the home <laughs> office, you know, once every two weeks or so, and we get to read those letters. So we're all about it. We really, truly, we do value you, you folks, because if we didn't have you, we would sit and be sitting here on a video call, just yucking it up and acting like idiots, which that's pretty much what we do anyway. So anyway, guys, let's wrap this thing up. I still had some more reader mail to do, but we, we tapped it out. So make sure you tell all your friends about the gun cranks and check out AmericanHandgunner.com, GunsMagazine.com, and of course our sister website, AmericanCop.com.
Let's keep defunding the mainstream media and support the thin blue line. So anyway, on behalf of Tom McHale and Roy Huntington, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Hope you guys have a great time, and we will see you at the next episode of The Gun Cranks.